Welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I am your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is AJ Monette, the senior producer of live events for Tough Mudder LLC. We're here to discuss extreme running, overcoming obstacles. Welcome, AJ. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. I'm so glad to have you. It's such Tough Mudder is such a neat organization. You host world-class obstacle course events, races with running distances ranging from 5K to 100 mi uh, 100 mile distances, even a 24-hour event. Um, your shorter distance events are not described as competitive, but instead as personal challenges that can require teamwork to complete many of the course obstacles. However, your endurance series are more competitive. So in your opinion, which event formats are most popular and is one more difficult to operate than another? I would definitely say the most popular one is uh, the shorter formats, the people that are you know, just kind of trying their hand at OCR or maybe haven't been exposed to that before. And um, that's kind of like your, your average everyday athlete. Uh, we try to appeal to people that can come out so anybody can do our events. The endurance series are for the more hardcore, experienced, seasoned athlete that train for these kind of things. I wouldn't recommend somebody just uh, starting with that one. You definitely got to work your way up to it. Um, we try to have those events live within each other, so it's not too much of a lift operationally, but definitely the bigger, longer formats require a lot more resources uh, so they can provide challenges that maybe the, the shorter formats do not when you're planning them. Yeah, such as what? What kind of resources are you referring to? All, all kinds. Uh, number one would be like land use. You need more terrain, obviously, for the longer formats, um, more manpower, whether that's staff or we rely a lot on volunteers or uh, local labor to help us out in certain areas of our event. Um, medical coverage, you know, you have to expand over a larger footprint. You need more people to cover that area to make sure everyone's running safely as possible. Um, for us, we truck all of our materials and obstacles into each location. So just more trucks for bigger events and, and putting on that whole display. So uh, definitely a lot more of everything when you're expanding the format. Wow. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like something you'd have to um, provide a lot more resources for. And really, just you know, let's talk a little bit about what makes Tough Mudder so special or unique from other extreme running or obstacle course events. So why do... Why are people attracted to Tough Mudder? Yeah, as you mentioned too, kind of earlier, Tough Mudder is um, not the competitive format of OCR racing. We're kind of the brand that is inclusive for everyone. We really uh, pitch for the teamwork aspect. Um, our obstacles, most of them are designed so you cannot do them by yourself unless you're an extreme OCR athlete. We want you to go out there, uh, achieve things that you didn't think were possible, but we also want you to do it in a team format. So whether you come with a group of people or whether you meet somebody on the course or whether you're at an obstacle and you need a hand getting boosted up that wall, you know, the person next to you is your teammate. And we say that every wave, uh, every start speech, we really encourage the, the teamwork and camaraderie. So I think that separates us from a lot of the other players in the OCR space. Absolutely. And we do have a question from a viewer and you mentioned the extreme events have, endurance events have a lot more course to cover. And these are really um, events that are spread out over a, an air, a large area. So what happens if there is an emergency? How do you communicate a crisis to athletes, staff, volunteers spread out over a really wide area? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we have a lot of different protocols in place. So we have our emergency action plans, we call them EAPs, uh, that all the staff is kind of familiar with going into an event. That's just standard for all of the the tough hunters that we put on, but each venue is different. The terrain is different. Uh, we have maps that we create for each event about an evacuation plan. We go over that with the staff. Uh, if, hey, if something happens at this part of the course, we direct everybody here. Uh, we have the capability of sending out texts or emails to our participants on the ground if something happens in an instant. Um, we have a medical team that we work with uh, that is doing all of the care on site. So if there's something going on, uh, we need to work with them to get people to the safe area or if they need to treat anybody, a uh, discommunication with them. All of like the communication that happens during the event amongst the staff is done via radio. So there's a high level radio channel that my job is you know, responsible for monitoring and relaying any important event 
a specific information to the heads of the different other areas. So just communication from the top down is kind of where we go from if something happens. And you talk about evacuation a lot. Your events are really held more in open areas. They're not, you know, if we compare like the, the Boston Marathon bombing, that was in a downtown, very heavily populated location, whereas your events are more um, rural or open locations. So where do people evacuate to if an evacuation is necessary? Yeah, so most of our venues are, you know, farms or raceways or motocross or parks. Um, so not exactly having the infrastructure you can send people to. Uh, sometimes we have the luxury of being able to send people, you know, to a, a big building or a barn or something like that if the venue has it. But most of the time, uh, the safest place for us to send people is, is back to their cars, you know, back to the parking lot. Um, we don't want people clustering under tents if there's high winds or lightning or weather or anything like that. So usually the message is send people uh, to the nearest structure, which is not always possible. So back to the parking lot, to the cars, to the buses, whatever way they got into the event is the best place for us to direct them. Let's talk about weather. I know some locations, um, you know, there's times, certain times of year where weather can surprise the best of planners, <laughs> um, things that uh, may create a danger to people in an outdoor open location. You use water and many of your obstacles and um, which, you know, it could be a problem with lightning or other extreme weather issues. So um, you mentioned sending people back to their car, but that would probably be pretty challenging to react. Um, what do you do to plan for weather issues? Yeah, um, I've been a part of over 50 plus Tough Motors now. And I think luckily we've we've only had to deal with really extreme weather and evacuations maybe two to three times uh, in my time being here. But as you mentioned, we are all over the country. We have 27 events in North America alone this year. So um, those can be anywhere from Southern Florida to uh, Seattle. So we're kind of spanning the gambit of climates and, and areas to deal with. Um, when we have to do some kind of evacuation, uh, it's usually getting people off the course, that's the hardest part. Uh, so we use our staff resources to go to certain cluster points on the course to direct people you know, off the normal course path, getting them back to uh, the shelters, to their cars on the quickest routes as possible. We're the experts in that property at that point. So we know the fastest way to get people back because this is the first time these people are seeing this property. We've been there for a week and a half setting up. So we know where to go to direct people uh, to get them back as quickly and safely as possible. Yeah, and how do you, how do you actually get that message um, when people are spread out all over? Do you have walkie-talkies? What kind of devices do you use? Yeah, we use radios like an LTL signal radio. Um, our core staff, which is combined of you know Tough Mudder staff and then the medic team that we we bring into each event. Uh, so there's probably you know 15 dedicated Tough Mudder staff out there, and then we also utilize our volunteers at each obstacle to kind of be extra sets of eyes and ears for safety uh, monitoring and letting us know if somebody needs medical attention at an obstacle or if something doesn't look right, they'll call us and one of our staff members will come over and check it out. So tons of radios and we communicate a lot via that. So if it's not somewhere that a physical Tough Mudder staff member is, we have a volunteer there and they're making that messaging to the participants, hey, you know, we have a storm coming through, you need to hold here for a minute or you can't go in this obstacle because it's made of metal truss and there's lightning you know two miles out uh, or hey we need to get you back to your car so there's there's different levels of thresholds that we kind of follow when we're monitoring severe weather in the area does that include text messaging to the participants yeah we can send them a text pretty much instantly on site um, obviously the majority of them do not have their phone when they're out there running the event but uh, we can send that pretty instantly a lot to think about for sure when it comes to the safety of the athletes and your staff and volunteers. Speaking of volunteers, they're a really big part of your operations and at each location, they're pretty critical for your operations. Um, you have about 25 to 30 full-time staff at each event. The rest are really volunteers staffing registration, the finish line, the bag drop. Um, an interesting way to recruit volunteers or to solidify those volunteers by it, in exchange for them working a full day shift, they get a free run and maybe get early act or get access to events or waves that were already sold out. So um, how do you actually train these volunteers? Because many of them are probably one-time volunteers or maybe 
once a year volunteer, but how do you train them to minimize any kind of risk of loss to your organization or your participants? Yeah, volunteers are, are definitely crucial to us. We have a whole uh, workforce team that's dedicated, you know, to to working on our volunteer program. Uh, we call them the MVPs. So uh, there are MVP volunteers, and we get them to come to our events in exchange, as you mentioned, for a ticket uh, to running the event. So it's a great way, you know, to to kind of work off that that balance of uh, paying for a Tough Mudder ticket. But to your point, a lot of them, you know, only come around once a year or if we're in their particular market. Uh, so we do send out some pre-event communication. We have some like training videos that we send them if they're working registration, but each person gets a, a briefing from like their area leader. So we get all our volunteers and in the morning we do a general briefing, welcome to Tough Mudder, thank you for being here. Here's things to look out for. And they kind of break off into their section. So you know, you ate working registration, go here and they'll teach you how to work all the scanners. You do like a 10 minute um, kind of run through. And then, you know, the best way to do it at that point is to start scanning tickets. And we have staff that are up there at registration, you know, keeping their eyes out there to answer any questions. Uh, for the course volunteers, it's the same thing. They're the ones that are out there, you know, looking after the obstacles for us because we can't be everywhere at once. So uh, they get a radio and they get a briefing from a Tough Mudder staff member on, hey, this is your obstacle. This is how it works. This is what it should look like. If you see something, call us, we'll come over. Um, if somebody you know scrapes their knee or whatever happens, like, call us over, we'll get a medic over to you. Um, so definitely just a lot of briefing uh, on the ground as it's happening. Um, most of the time the volunteers pick it up pretty quick, but sometimes you gotta go back and, and refresh their memory for sure. Yeah, I would I would imagine. And if I guess if they've done a Tough Mudder before, they have that familiarity with um, you know, what a, a race course would look like, an event course would look like. Um, but it's not without risk. And I think that some of your volunteers probably um there maybe there's certain obstacles rather that uh, would be very difficult to just ha only have volunteer staffing. Um I know there's risk to athletes, they can suffer from heart attacks, hypothermia, head injuries, knee injuries. Um, and back in 2013, I know a drowning occurred at Tough Mudder at one of the obstacles where participants were expected to swim in a, a pool of muddy water. Um, this unfortunately triggered a wrongful death lawsuit against Tough Mudder that was eventually settled out of court. But what kind of safety mechanisms do you have in place to try and prevent a similar tragedy such as this one? Yeah, in addition to our volunteer staff, you know, we have a medical staff that is all throughout the course, um, dedicated lifeguards at all of the water obstacles that are over a certain depth threshold. We have a global safety committee that I'm on uh, and meets every week just to go over, hey, this is what we saw last week at this event. People got hurt at this obstacle. Was there anything we could have done about it? Uh, how do we prevent those kind of injuries in the future? Um, so definitely safety is the biggest thing that we look out for, safety of our participants, safety of our staff, safety of our volunteers. So just making sure that we're looking at it from all the possible angles, um, but definitely a great uh, question and, and something we think about pretty heavily when we're planning these events. What is a global safety committee? Uh, for that, it just means we have an office based in the US and in the UK. So it includes members from both offices talking about what they see Maybe you know the trends in the UK sometimes are a lot different than what we see in the US. Um, so just considering it from from both sides, but we try to uh, make sure that both companies or both brands are on the same page. That way, we're doing things the same across the board. Absolutely, and having medical personnel um, on site, particularly when you're in these more rural locations, can be really critical. And the cause of even minor injuries is probably pretty great when we're talking about obstacle course events. Um, Definitely. We see, you know, less than than one percent of the people that come to the Tough Mudder need to be seen by one of the medics. And the most common things that people are seen for are you know, scrapes, cuts, abrasions, that kind of stuff. So um, in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty low contact numbers, but we want to make sure we're considering every possible risk. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then describe some of these obstacles, because some of our viewers may be trying to envision what kind of obstacles do you create for these Tough Mudder experiences? Yeah, it's um, first and foremost, you know, we're, we're a mud run, so we want to make sure people are getting muddy and getting to play around in that. So you may think there's just one kind of mud pit, but there's, you know, seven or eight variations that we've come up with and, and ways to get you nice and muddy. 
Um, I think what makes us unique also in the OCR space is we're kind of known for our obstacle innovation. Um, we have things like monkey bars that you would do as a kid, but definitely like an adult version called Funky Monkey. Uh, we have a giant ice bath that we send people in called Arctic Enema. Uh, we have a signature obstacle called electroshock therapy where we electrocute people. Um, that's kind of what they have to do so they can get into the finish line. We have a 35 foot tall A-frame called Butterhorn, which is uh, our tallest obstacle. So there's a lot of different things you'll encounter um, that will test, you know, your, your mental strength, your physical strength, uh, upper body, legs, you know, obstacles that require teamwork. So um, not just your standard mud pit for sure. Are, have any obstacles been proposed that are too extreme for <laughs> Tough Mudder that you decided that was not worth the, the risk or the challenge? For sure. Uh, we, we run a contest every year. Uh, internally with the employees where, you know, people think of obstacles and try to come up with new innovations. We also do like an outside competition where the participants can submit their ideas. And uh, a lot of them are great, but a lot of them are maybe uh, impractical to implement in real life. So you have to be able to look at those and, and kind of move on. <laughs> and you mentioned you're there uh, on site a week and a half and you're starting to build out the event because it takes so much preparation to install these obstacles what kind of safety check do you practice to make sure that these obstacles are going to be safe and can withstand so many athletes um, using these obstacles safely yeah all of our obstacles you know are are certified by an engineer um, the plans that are stamped and then our build team ensures they're following those standards and those specs when they're building the obstacles. Uh, and then actually on the Thursday or Friday, depending on timing before the event, before we let any participants on the obstacles, um, we go around and do our safety tours. So we have a checklist that we follow that we come up with in the global safety committee that I mentioned earlier. And it just references things to look for on each obstacle. Is this safe? We take photos, we document things. Is this height the right height? Is this water depth the right water depth? Um, so anything that we see that might be trending from a previous event, uh, we address that as well. I'd be like, hey, has that been added to the list for this event? So we can make sure we're looking out for that. So it's an ever evolving list, but we do have our, our standards obviously that we stick to and then um, we're just checking and filling that out and dotting all the I's and crossing the T's and making sure it's submitted before we let anybody on these obstacles. Is someone out there actually monitoring the course as it's being built to ensure that nobody's tampering with it or that it doesn't get damaged in any way? And are, are there any um, day of obstacle checks? Do you guys actually inspect things day of before anyone actually gets on the course? Yep, our construction manager uh, is responsible like morning of to drive around and check on everything to make sure it hasn't changed from when we checked it the day before. Uh, so there is that morning of and we'll do like, hey, green light, everything's good to go. Or, you know, hey, we got to add more water here. We need a couple minutes to to fix this. So that's definitely something we check every morning. Uh, but the in-depth, you know, full on checks is, is done the day before to make sure um, there's nothing unsafe or nothing that we're not expecting. So. Uh, the construction manager is the one who takes care of that role. Okay. So there's not really someone monitoring the site 24 hours a day. It's just more of a pre-event check. Yeah, we do have security depending on the location, but they're not roaming the whole, you know, 10 mile property and, and checking everything out there. But um, all of our staff kind of knows what to look for. And if something looks out of place, they'll, they'll call somebody over, but we haven't had too many issues with that. You mentioned earlier some of the places where you actually hold your events and and these none of these places are property that you actually own so uh and you some of this requires you to actually um uh change the the land dig dig things uh move move dirt things like that um what kind of challenges do you experience dealing with you know private and public landowners to host your events yeah, each venue is very unique and very different. Um, you know, we go to, like I mentioned earlier, parks or motocross places. Uh, we have a winery that we go to in Missouri. We have um, a baseball stadium we go to in California. So it's a bunch of different types of people, a bunch of different types of property. Uh, all of them in baseline in the contract, you know, is we they agree to let us do these excavations and in return, uh, we agree to 
put the land back as it was when we found it. So kind of the baseline care for standard is uh, make it look how it was before we got there. Sometimes that takes a little longer because uh, the nature of our business is um, mud pits and, and kind of making a little bit of a mess. Uh, but we've had venues that we have gone to you know, 10 plus years now that we keep going back to. So I think we have strong relationships with them and um, making sure we, they're taken care of after we leave and leaving them in a good place. I know your operations for your events are in North America, but you mentioned um, an office in Europe and there are events um, all over the globe. So talk to me about how groups um, can pursue a license to become a franchise of the Tough Letter brand and, and why do you choose to franchise that out? What are the risks of franchising or the benefits of franchising these branded events? Yeah. Uh this office, you know, in the US, we're a remote office now, but we handle uh, the North American operations. So that includes the US and the events we do in Canada. And then the UK team handles the ones they do over uh, in uh, London and around that area. And then we do, as you mentioned, international licensees. Uh, so that's a program that people, if they're interested in, can reach out to our international marketing team. Uh, I think there's a link on our website for parties that are interested in that kind of thing. Um, but I think we found that in order to have like the global presence for our brand, it's best to work with these partners that are already established in those certain countries and starting everything up from scratch again from Tough Mudder side. Uh, I was lucky enough to get to go work one in 2019 in Croatia. So our first partner ever in Croatia, there never been a Tough Mudder there uh, until we went there in October of that year. And I just got to help them get up to speed operationally, um, it's kind of interesting when you go there and, and none of them know what a tough mudder really looks like. They've seen the pitch decks, they've seen like the obstacle drawings, but they've never done it in person. So they're all looking at you to be like, hey, is this right? Does this look like how it's supposed to? Um, so we just find it's much easier to work with those kind of people who are established in those communities. That makes more sense than us setting up our own internal operation because getting off the ground in a, in a new country, is a huge lift uh, for everyone. Absolutely. And all the requirements and navigating that process and probably a learning curve, a steep learning curve uh, to go into a new place every time. Yeah, Not to mention language barriers and all of that stuff. So fair, fair point. Let's talk about another um, issue that's impacted us globally. And that's the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, despite Tough Mudder holding events outdoors, I, I know you guys were impacted and several of your 2020 events were, were postponed. Um, so you've implemented several safety procedures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, you your events historically have around 10,000 people at them, which is a lot of people in one place. And a lot of your obstacles require teamwork where people are working together and maybe physically touching one another to complete the obstacles. So how do you limit exposure at your events to COVID-19? Yeah, that was a, a big question for us in 2020. Uh, we actually didn't hold any events in 2020 due to COVID-19. Uh, obviously, many people in the event space were, were doing virtual formats or switching to that at that time. So we did uh, some you know, virtual Tough Mudders and had some great partners we worked with there. Um, our 24-hour race due at the end of the year called World Toughest Mudder, we actually did it over Zoom uh, for that year. So that was kind of a fun operational challenge to figure that one out. But uh, I was pretty involved in writing our, you know, return to live events and our company COVID plan when we came back from that uh, for 2021. So last year, we were able to put on 20 events across the country, um, definitely with a different focus than maybe before. We were kind of looking uh, to the local governments to provide us, you know, context on what they were doing in their areas. And each jurisdiction was a little bit different. Um, we had to you know, implement at the beginning, much like you see at airports or Disney World, um, social distancing signage and wait here signage and ample amounts of hand sanitizer available in the festival area and um, access to masks. If participants wanted those, the staff was wearing masks, we were staff testing. Uh, and as things have kind of rolled back in the normal world, that's kind of how Tough Mudder has, has gone as well, just to follow uh, the lead of the government and kind of work the same way that they've seen the progression for live events returning uh, during COVID-19. So definitely a big adjustment period for us all. And I think we saw participants being hesitant to 
uh, rejoin live events. But I think once they saw the first couple of Tough Mudders get back off the ground, we saw um, tons of jumps in our participant registration for our later events in the year. Um, and people were feeling safe. They could go back into this kind of environment. Um, we only had one event where we had to require participants to wear masks, and that was due to a local mask mandate in the Seattle area. So uh, mm -hmm. most of them ended up going off somewhat un unaltered from what they would previously have known a tough mother to be. I cannot even imagine how you would do one of your events with a mask on. Some of the activities are water-based uh, obstacles, and um, I imagine some of the athletes probably were struggling to keep a mask over their, <laughs> their nose and mouth. Yeah, not not the ideal environment for that, but um, we were able to, to make something work. So wow, um, that's Incredible. that's a, our longest standing market that we're in. Our venue is our Seattle one. Uh, they're they're a good partner there, so I'm glad we were able to make it work. Yeah, and you you've implemented some start times now, so that there's um, kind of scheduled times where people know when to arrive, when to show up, and maybe maybe not everybody's in the area at the same time. Have you actually reduced capacity, reduced your numbers overall because of COVID and trying to limit the numbers um, that are yeah. around each other? <laughs> we have. We've been smarter about, you know, our ticket selection. We've uh, kind of done them in 15-minute blocks. So in the old way, we would just kind of let people sign up for as many people that want to sign up, and then we'll send them a start time assignment. In this new way, we kind of only opened a certain amount of spots per uh, time frame, and then once they filled up, they were gone, and you had to either sign up for a different time or sign up for the next day. Um, so just kind of putting a hard cap on how many people could be in a certain area within that given hour. So that's definitely helped control the flow a lot. So other than the things we've talked about already, what would you say is the biggest challenge you face in your job? Well, those were those were a lot of the big ones that I work on. Um, Permitting is another big thing that I work on in my role in each area is just different. Uh, they require different things. You have to work with the local towns, the local stakeholders, um, a lot of personality and people management and just dealing with uh, dealing with the different personalities you find in the local government. Um, those are those are always fun to deal with for me. But uh, yeah, safety, number one for us and then uh, working out the different nuances of each venue is is probably the biggest parts of my role. Well, fantastic. This has been really informative and I really appreciate your insight to these extreme running, overcoming obstacles, and it's such a fascinating um, organization and the events that you put on. So thank you to our viewer question today and thank you for our other viewers for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. In two weeks, our guest is Jessica Wirtz from Innova Sports Medicine, who will discuss sports injuries and concussions. We will see you then. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.